Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. It's time to dance. That's the lead in to Lost Nation's newest musical production, The Prom. And this is the narrative associated with the, the book. Down on their luck, Broadway stars shake up a small Indiana town as they rally behind a team who just wants to go to the prom with her girlfriend. And Lost Nation says, and like Hairspray back in 2016, our directors and designers' ingenuity will make this big show fit into the theater. So joining me today are two people involved in the production. So please welcome Kim and Josh. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay, so Kim, I'm going to start with you only because th this is not our first time doing an interview. And I'm a little familiar with some of your background, but could you talk a little bit about your involvement with Lost Nation and your involvement with this production specifically? Sure. Uh, I started as an usher in 97 with 1997 with uh, Lost Nation. I wasn't even living in Montpelier. And then I entered and I was a production intern in 2000. So I did lots of the same things I'm doing this summer. Box office, front of house, you know, uh, choreography, stage management, you name it. So I had a whole summer to work here doing that. Since then, I have stayed involved, a lot of times just ushering, sometimes house managing, sometimes choreography, you name it. And um, I was looking for something to do between teaching at Norwich, and I, um, Kathleen said, do you want to stage manage uh, Three Sisters for Women, which was the previous show this summer. Then she said, jokingly, oh, do you also want to stage manage The Prom? And I love this musical, and I thought for about a week, because I knew it was two shows back to back, and then I said, Yes. So that's how I got. So could you, you're referencing, you know, Kim and Kathleen, who are the people who founded Lost Nation. Could you talk a little bit about how they happened to choose the prom for this year's summer musical? Because it's, it hasn't been that long since the Broadway debut and the Broadway run so there had to have been some work involved in getting the royalties to do this. Well, I, what happened was uh, the prom did very well on Broadway. It won some Tonys, it was amazing. And then it got released really pretty quickly to the community. Last year, Lyric Theater did it and a, and a huge, amazing production. And uh, we'll talk later about this, but I believe Taryn might have choreograph that one as well but I'm not sure so they did it they beat us a little to the punch we were going to do it last summer so then we said what do we want to do we ended up doing the Adams family last year which was also phenomenal so then we said then we'll do it next year so but but the reason for choosing it I think for most community theaters is it speaks to community and acceptance and hey let's all just treat each other like human beings and it's a lovely beautiful score funny and so how could you not do it right and it's got a bunch of teens so we get to give them an opportunity to be on a professional stage and really and i will say this work their hearts out which they're doing <laughs> so so this is part of the summer camp program oh, right. of lost nation or is there an affiliation between the two there are many members of the teen group who have done camps in the past there is a separate summer camp that goes on. What we did with this is there was a huge audition call and the teens were asked in to come to what we call the boot camp a week before everybody else. So they did this intensive camp where they were doing workshops, they were learning. 
here's what you do for a headshot. We're going to give you a headshot you can have later. Then they were learning all of the dances and the choreography ahead of time um, and just really doing this intensive. And then the rest of the cast came in um, and joined them as we started to do all of the business of the play. And there are some familiar people who are coming back and are involved in this. And, and one of them is the director, Eric Love. Yes. Oh, gosh. So Eric Love has been involved with Lost Nation for many, many years. The first time I saw Eric on stage was here at Lost Nation. He did this play called Fully Booked. It was a one man show where he was on the phone taking reservations for some hotel or something. But he did every other character in the show. So he'd talk and then he'd give you the answer. I mean, he was just insanely good. So he has been coming back again and again over the years, and people will have seen him in things like Irma Vep, um, The 39 Steps, uh, you name it. He also has, he began uh, doing directorial stuff here with, uh, it's a Sarah Rule play, which is amazing. I can't remember the title. Eurydice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Which was amazing and had aerial flights and people were doing like, you know, Cirque du Soleil. It was amazing. Then he went down to Northern Stage and was a um, director down there for several years. Um, so he's he's been around and he's done a lot with us. And he it's just a joy to have him here. And, and as you had already sort of passively referenced, the choreography is being done by Tara Noel, who is someone who is well known in the theater community. Yeah, she does a ton of choreography at Lyric Theater. She just barely did choreography for Spamalot over in the Valley, with the Valley Players, and now she's over here. So yeah, she's like a Visa card. She's everywhere you want to be. And she's a, she's also so, such a lovely person and she works fast. You will not believe these dances that we have. <clears throat> and, and Tim Giles is the music director who is somebody who, if you've been to a musical at Lost Nation, is a name that's very familiar. Yes. And he has been like an additional director in some ways because he has so much knowledge. And to have him in the house while we're, while we're rehearsing, for anyone who's ever done a, a, a musical, oftentimes you just have like a recorded Broadway track and, the, and you know, a bunch of scores to look at. And he can say, no, no, there's only, there's only two counts of eight there, then you come in. So you can't do that much dance or, you know, whatever. So yeah, he's amazing. His so, band and so, that's some of the what you don't see behind the curtain. Yes. So let's talk about what's in front of the curtain and in the footlights. So Josh, let's let's talk about your involvement with Lost Nation. Yeah, so um, this is my first time working here. I am actually coming to Vermont from York Beach, Maine. And uh, it was just one of those things. They posted that they were looking for the role of Barry. I submitted an audition, got a call back, uh, and then booked the show. And it all happened within uh, two and a half weeks of a starting rehearsal. So yeah, so I'm very excited to be out here. Uh, I've worked extensively throughout the uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts Seacoast area for the last 11 years. And uh, now I'm here to do the prom. I'm playing the role of Barry. He's one of the Broadway stars that hears about this young lesbian girl and decides to come to Indiana and shake things up. Okay, so I did the narrative that Lost Nation put out sort of describing the production. As somebody who is, whose character is part of this story, can you sort of flush out a little bit? If I come to see this, what what can I expect to see on the stage in front of me? Whew. Well, um, the first thing I think of is, in terms of theater, it's it's classic musical theater comedy. It's just joke after joke after joke. The show's a laugh riot, but then it also has these moments where it just emotionally punches you in the gut. Uh, so I love the balance of it for an audience that you're going to feel so much joy and you, you're also going to feel some sadness, but you leave feeling joyful at the end. And it's just a full, it's a full experience of 
emotions, great big dance numbers. Um, yeah, just oh. it's it's a full package wise, I think. Okay, so if if I'm understanding what you're talking about, there, you know, it isn't just the smooth sailing event that there there's some conflict and there are things that are going to make me in my chair sort of tense up and 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 then you're going to make me feel joy inside. Yes. Okay. So was there anything that you needed to do to prepare for this role? Or could you talk a little bit about how you were as as an actor? How do you approach a role so that you are truly portraying what the character is supposed to represent? So uh, for me, I actually make image boards on Pinterest. So I gather images of um, different people I think the characters like, what I think their world is like, what I think their aesthetic and taste is like. So I can look through these images to help um, inhabit the character. And then usually when I'm picking a show, I like to pick certain traits and qualities of other actors or characters in shows to create like a combination. I, I like to say, I call it a character cocktail. Um, so, so, so you create an environment for your character and then you have your character live within it. Yes. So like for this particular show, for the character I'm playing, Barry, he has the, the sass and the stardom of a Nathan Lane, but his comedy timing is that of Jack from Will and Grace. But then he has that maternal instinct of like a Harvey Fire scene oh i i can hardly wait okay kim you're putting your hand up was there something you wanted to add i'm just saying i'm just watching him in rehearsal and as he says this i'm like yes that is exactly what's in this character and i love that because if we hadn't done this interview i might not have ever heard you say that and it's a brilliant way to uh, now i'm like okay next time i do a show i need a vision board <laughs> and a character, so that's really neat to combine. Okay, so, so the hand going up was actually an exclamation mark to what Josh was saying. <laughs> so Josh, what has this company been like? Because there are times that when you're part of a production, the interaction that happens between the actors is greater than the sum of its parts, which means you're more than just the character there, there's something that evolves among you. Have, has that been your experience with this production? Um, do you mean in terms of like as a, a company of performers? Yes. Yeah, so it's been really powerful for me. I'm coming in as the completely new person. Everybody has sort of a knowledge of each other or a, a history with each other. I felt very welcomed from the moment I got here and to be, it's something I love about doing theater is you're coming with a, a group of people that you don't always know, but you have a common goal and how you just come together and you do it. And I'm, you know, Liz, who's playing Emma, the lead girl, our characters kind of instantly have a bond. We understand each other and to be able to develop that bond with her through rehearsals and my other Broadway divas in it and just take these character arcs and journeys with them has been really special. And, and it must have been just a fun time playing a diva. Yes, it was so difficult to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is, this production when it first opened on Broadway got a, a lot of traction because of this representation of the LGBTQ plus community events that were happening, you know, on a, on a nationwide basis and locally, and sort of are representing ourselves. Are there a substantial number, or are there people from within the LGBTQ plus communities who are actively involved in this production? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Several, many. 
<laughs> Kim is going to go back to rehearsal today and do a head count saying, yo, this is the... Exactly. Okay, so with the time that we have left, Kim, I want to talk about, you know, the performance dates are July 18th through August... August 4th. 4th. And it's Thursday through Saturday at 730 and on Sundays at two o'clock. Is that correct? That's correct. And you can reserve tickets by going online to the Lost Nation site. Yes. Is it a website, Facebook, both? We are both in both places if you want to find information. Um, the, our website's lostnationtheater.org. And you can just click on the poster and reserve tickets. Um, for people who have a, a, a preference to call, you can just call the box office and, and leave a reservation that way. Okay, we'll, we'll make sure all of that contact information gets posted. Now, but there's a sort of word of warning we need to give to people. You know, Lost Nation is in City Hall in Montpelier, and it's up several flights of stairs. And unfortunately, the elevator is still one of the casualties from last season's flooding. So if accessibility is an issue for you, you may want to get in touch with Lost Nation to see what might be possible, or if this is a production, you merely need to stand outside and, and wave at. Well, here's another thing is uh, what we have been doing is doing a live stream of the shows at least once. So there's the possibility of going to the site and buying the live stream ticket and watching from home. Okay. So well, th that sh information should be up, if not now, then soon, where you can just go on your computer and watch it over Zoom. Um, and, you know, we've had a lot of support from um, Dominic Spillane of Theater Engine, who's really good at sort of coming in and, re you know, really recording a great show for us. That may or may not be there yet, but we do that. We've been doing that at least once for every show. And it's usually then uh, recorded and it's available to the run end of the run. All righty. And, and with that, thank you for spending this time with us. And, and in the old Broadway tradition, break a leg. Thank you. Yeah. All righty. Hey, everybody. I'm here with Monica D. Giovanni, friend of the show, here for a return visit. Welcome, Monica. Thank you, Anne. It's great to be here. It's really good to see you. And rather than um, reading your conventional biography, which we've done in previous interviews, I thought maybe I would begin by sharing your artistic statement, if I, if you don't mind. Yes, thank you. The current exploration of your work, I'm going to read it in the second person, investigates themes of birth, death, and rebirth, strength and vulnerability, impermanence and interconnectedness, nature, resiliency, chaos, Zen arts, the study of Buddhist cosmology, as it relates to uh, the human condition. Your spiritual practice as a yoga and meditation teacher and consciousness itself, that's a tall order. And we'll get a chance to look at some of that material as we continue to talk. With isolation being one of the greatest ills of our time, the remedy of interconnectedness and peace relies on each of us seeing our individuality as part of a whole that is so important. Yoga and meditation allow people to meet themselves in their most vulnerable moments and see outside of their struggles enough to find a connection. Your creative expression with oil paint, ink, watercolor, and other media, including expressive movement, is infused with your 30 plus year relationship with yoga and meditation. And you are an interdisciplinary artist. Thank you. Your art seeks to create deeper self understanding and compassion for individual viewers and a gentler connection through society. That's a lovely artistic statement. Thank you. <laughs> I've been looking at your website, um, which is very impressive, and I encourage the audience to take a look at it and um, discovered that your work is divided into three categories, oil paintings, Enzo Gallery, the Enzo Gallery, and the Mindstream series. 
Do these divisions represent a progression or are they a simultaneous development? Um, I think they're a simultaneous development. Um, I, I moved to Vermont in 2002 and previously had been uh, mostly focused on performance art when I lived in Boston. And when I moved here, I switched my my form of expression because so much of my performance art expression was interconnected. It was about community. It was about collaborating with other people. And I didn't immediately, it took a long time to find that those those outlets. And so I was working more independently as a visual artist uh, in 2D media and I started oil painting. But I'm also a sketchbook person and I'm always doodling and drawing on the side. So I, I was working on this main body of oil paintings and in the background, I'm using pencil and water-based media and ink. Um, and so there really have been three different bodies of work evolving, well, or three different forms of expression evolving all at the same time. It's just mm -hmm. I put forward the oil painting for a good 15 plus years and the rest of the stuff was kind of happening in the background. Well, you said the oil painting is inspired by many years of yoga and meditation, different forms of dance and movement and a love of nature. You've developed a meticulous style. I'm reading from your artist statement about this. Okay. A deliberate multi-layering technique that mirrors the effects of watercolors and takes full advantage of the complex transparencies of high oil paints. That's very impressive. Um, what I like, especially speaking of specific engagement is gonna emerge later in our talk, is that in support of pollinators and as part of your butterfly series, you include a resource list of organizations and other outlets that are doing the work of saving pollinators for everyone to use and share. So that's pretty cool. But let's take a look at an example of an oil painting if we could. Okay. Um... Let's see. This is Nymphalis Antiopia. Oh, how yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, so this is the latest butterfly. And um, I worked, this was a commission that I worked on last year. And it took a long time to complete. Uh, the, the painting is actually quite large. It's a good, I can't remember the dimensions right now, but it's at least two and a half feet wide and a couple feet high. Um, and I can't zoom, I don't think I can zoom in on it, but <laughs> I can't in, in, in the display mode that I'm using, but it's highly detailed. There are hairs painted on the eyeballs because these particular, the morning cloak butterfly has hairy eyeballs. And I wonder if that's where the statement came from. Um, these butterflies are furry and you can kind of see it from this image, but the fur is painted on there with small brushes. And, and like you read in the statement, it's many layers of oil paint. How long did it take you to do it? <laughs> this, this particular butterfly took much longer than it normally would have because I had started it um, a bunch of years ago and then had a head injury. And so partially how my creative process evolved from doing butterflies to doing the Enzo paintings is that the head injury prohibited me from um, a, a certain degree of concentration. And my practice, my, my art practice moved from the concentration practice and it also mirrored my meditation practice. So it moved from concentration practice more towards mindfulness practice. And the two are interlinked in terms of developing um, personal understanding and spiritual evolution. Uh, and so I, I just switched gears to maintain a connection to my creative process as well as to my meditation practice. Well, speaking of the Enzo paintings, let's look at an example from the Enzo Gallery, born mm -hmm. out of Zen arts. And you can tell us this also, I'm sure Enzo or Zen circles are an opportunity to embody, embody the unseen. You use ink, iridescent pigment and other materials to capture the ineffability of time in moment to moment experience. The brush, ink and paper become a direct extension of body, mind and the universe. Let's take a, take a look at, a here we are, a traditional Enzo right before us. Can you tell us about it, Monica? 
Yeah, so this, I, I have another example of a different Enzo. This is a more traditional one. Um, it's not on rice paper, which is in Japan. They use rice paper. This is on ink on watercolor paper, and it's quite large. You know, when, one of the interesting things about the Enzos is that when you see them through digital media, you really can't tell how big they are. And mm -hmm. this one is, again, probably two feet by two feet in size. Um, and it was straight ink and a single stroke painting. Um, differently than the, the oil paintings, which have a construct to them, they have a map to them. They are, draw, I draw them out freehand based on photographs and they're essentially line drawings filled in with color. And whereas with these Enzo paintings, all of the preliminary work is internal. It's all mental practice. It's about um, meditation and then bringing the whole self into the expression of the painting. Traditionally, like a, I, I call this a traditional Enzo because it's just painted with the ink in a single brush stroke. And is it, is it traditional because it's black and white or does that matter? Um, it's a material. It's it's material and, and just, a, just plain ink. Mm -hmm. um, traditional Japanese, Arts are very much a purist m method. Um, they're very uh, um, disciplined in how they work, and everything is scripted. Every single brush stroke, every single way you position your body, the texture and content of, of the mind space that you bring into the painting is clarified and very clear. Um, and I wouldn't say they're necessarily goal driven, but the approach has is 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 traditional. Um, originally, these paintings were done by Zen masters, and then one of the teachers I practiced with, Kazuaki Tanahashi, kind of reclaimed. He's a, a Japanese man who's an internationally recognized Buddhist scholar and translator and artist. And he was, uh, he still is, and he's 90 years old, uh, anti-nuke artist. And he did a lot of work in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, having come from a culture of Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He was very much against nuclear, use of any nuclear energy. And part of his activist um his activism was to reclaim this traditional art form and and give it back to give it to people so they could also participate in it. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. I've I've really appreciated that teaching that he's offered and and am gonna embody that in my own <laughs> in my own offering um, to the town coming up here in August. Um, Let's look uh, at a, let's look at a large Enzo, uh, an alternative like a more expressive one. Yes, yeah, the large one we'll talk about. So this this Enzo is less alternative. Obviously, it's not just straight black ink. It's also oh. on watercolor. It's twelve by twelve in inches, and it's a mixture of acrylic ink, gouache, and and a uh, powder pigment, um, and. I, I like this one because it's very honest. And a lot of times people think of Enzo paintings as a tool for relaxation. They're um, kind of almost cliche in representing kind of a peaceful, calm mind. And in this Enzo, in the moment that I was painting it, I, I was feeling connected, like deeply connected, which is also a part of painting an Enzo. And yet I had a lot of strong feelings and the Enzos are spontaneous. They are arriving out of whatever is happening internally. And so I was feeling some aggression and some strong feelings and emotions. And that's what came through the painting. And that this is also part of reclaiming it, I guess, for normal people and taking it down off the loft of being maybe just for Zen masters and and as a way for people to express themselves without feeling like they have to draw 
or feeling like they have to understand uh, any medium, one of the ways that this practice is taught is you can kind of close your eyes and just use your finger and draw a circle in the air and you're painting an Enzo, or you can take a stick and draw in the dirt, or you can just scratch a rock on another rock on a wall. You can use absolutely anything and it, it gives you something. It connects you to yourself. It connects you to your creative process. It connects you to, um, you know, whatever it is that's happening around you. Cause uh, has said that it's an act of, it, it's, it's being creative without, it's a creative act without being creative. And I thought that was really interesting because honestly, drawing a circle is drawing a circle. You know, I think adding the color and, and the pigment is an act of creativity. Whereas when you see the the black and the black on white, I don't know if I'm necessarily creating that. I'm I'm having a creative experience, but I'm painting a circle. And so it's getting past that difference and that delineation. I think where people who aren't familiar with it or they see it and they're not quite sure how to approach it is, is what's important. Is it colorful because of all the emotions you were feeling when you did it? Yeah, that was me expressing myself in that moment. I was working, you know, I have a lot of them and there there's a lot of different color depending on kind of what I'm working with. And it, it's a, the process is re, very cathartic for me. It, it, it helps me feel more clear after I've gone through painting a series of these. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to the Mindstream series. Uh, these paintings differ from the Enzo paintings in that they're much, very much about feelings as opposed to the direct experience of emptiness meditation articulating wordless experience with bare attention through insight meditation. These paintings wind through the visual field of your unconscious as felt experience and connection to the world around you. I'm using a second person. The lines vibrate and meander into and next to each other, overlapping to accentuate the space underneath it uh, that may, until it may be until it may be completely obscured. This is called acceptance. Tell us about it, please. Yeah, so this is one of a series that I've just begun. Um, these are more, as opposed to the, the oil painting, which does take a certain degree of concentration, we distinguish between uh, concentration and mindfulness. So basically, the, this is an opportunity for me to unwind periods of, of intense concentration and also get back in touch with myself. So, you know, spending doing something, say like, I have to work in spreadsheets sometimes. And I, I don't know if you ever have to spend time in spreadsheets, but it kind of just pulls all your focus and concentration into a very sharp point. And sometimes you have to just keep staying at that point, kind of shuffling the numbers and, and, and kind of looking at the little boxes and making things add up and looking at data, you know, analyzing data is a very different mindset than, than a flow state in which this painting illustrates. And so to help calm myself down and get out of that analytical mind, I, I do these paintings to help relax that tension because it, it for me I can do it but it's it can create a lot of stress <laughs> so it's also these paintings also help me alleviate stress as as the the Enzo paintings do so there is some therapeutic element to doing this just say like meditation um, they it's taught in meditation is that if your meditation practice is stressing you out then that is a point of understanding um, and a, maybe a point of departure to do things differently. Makes sense. Um, yeah. As I review your career and your artwork, um, I see that you sort of seem to um, express a combination of um, love of nature, spirituality, um, and civic engagement. So yeah. tell us a little bit 
about how this informs your art, this combination of three components and um, how it's manifesting currently. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, the love of nature comes through in the butterfly series. Um, and I love to set, tell people about that. Uh, I showed, I got to show those paintings to my Zen teacher and I was kind of exploring different topics. And I had said to her, well, at some point, I think I would like to paint Buddhas. And she looked at the painting and she said, butterflies are Buddhas. <laughs> and that's kind of like a good teacher will do. It opened up my understanding of my approach to my creative expression. And it really, it was very freeing um, because it, it's one of the foundational teachings is that interconnection is that we're not separate. Um, I'm not separate from the computer or from my my notepad. I'm not separate from you. You know, we're not bound at the hip. We're not in a, you know, a lot of times people think relationship in terms of romantic relationship, but there all are all these different kinds of relationships. And um, particularly now where we're in a time when the country is so totally divided and there's a lot of hostility and there's, uh, I hear this a lot of, um, you know, I, I learned at a young age to never say I hate something because hate is such a strong word. And I really take that to heart. I have taken that to heart for my entire life well before I became, you know, I started pra Zen practice. Um, and maybe that's what led me to Zen practice is I don't want to hate things. I don't want to walk through the world hating things. I can strongly dislike something and I can make a judgment about something being good or bad or right or wrong, but to hate something does something inside of me that I don't like at all. And I don't like what it puts out to the world. Um, and, and so all of the, the meditation and the yoga helps me understand myself better so that I can feel more present when I walk through the world. And I really want that to come through my art and, and people really feel that. I don't know if they consciously know what they're feeling when they're, when they're near my art, but I, I get that feedback from folks is that it makes them feel calm or they want to kind of get a little closer to it or dive into it. And I think there's some of that desire for interconnection to come through. And so in terms of civic engagement um, and, and, and wanting to be connected to people. Um, I've been involved in like local politics a little bit here through the Arts Commission. And um, I've last year we had uh, the big flood here in Montpelier that destroyed our city. And um, just briefly, the town had four feet of water in it that emptied out almost every single storefront that had to throw away pretty much every single item that was connected and you know was was touched by the foul waters, um, and it was really really hard on everybody. It was devastating. It was outrageously expensive, um, and it took months and months to reclaim the town. And during that time, while everyone was cleaning up, it, everything was empty. It was murky. It was dusty. Um, the town business owners and, and the local community wanted to do something about that. I had already approached uh, the director of Montpelier Alive to get involved as an artist or maybe do an art project with town. And the, the business owners through the business uh, organization that is in town wanted to do something in the empty windows. And so the collaboration created the renewal project. And I stepped in with my my event producer background and my experience with the Arts Commission and my connection to the art community. And we collab we created the renewal project. And so oh in two weeks, I put a request for proposals out to as many news outlets as I could and spread through social media. And um, we gathered 16 over over four months it started with eight projects we got proposals from eight different individual artists um artist groups or or nonprofit organizations who were doing creative thing and we put art in the windows and it really helped shift the tone of 
how everyone was feeling in town because it gave people some hope. It brought some color into town. When people were visiting, it was we, there was signage on there. And so it kind of told the story of the flood uh, of what was happening because people who visited the town had no idea. And they, they I, yeah. Um, and so over the next three months from the beginning of October to the beginning of January, we had a total of 16 different projects in the windows. And as the businesses came back, the projects either moved or they came down, but it created some movement where it just felt very stagnant and very sad. It was really heartbreaking. Um, we created a walking map of the art projects. And so people could come and see the map and walk around town and take a look at things. And um, it was great. The, the project was in collaboration with Montpelier Alive and it was sponsored um, by the Vermont Community Foundation and National Life. Um, and so, yeah. I remember it was really inspiring because it was a desolate landscape before you entered with the renewal project. So yeah, that, you're very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about the Montpelier Art Walk and your contribution to it. That's coming right up. Yeah. So, um, so first off, there's one event that's happening in a few days, and by the time people see this, um, they won't they'll have missed it, <laughs> but um, it, it's the one year anniversary of the flood. And as we're talking in our Montpelier was spared from the flood that happened a, to the day a year later and our local outlying towns are again, devastated, which is really, really sad. But um, to mark the anniversary, the city had planned uh, a, a, a day of art making and music throughout town. And I'll be doing some, uh, as part of a group of other artists, uh, we're putting art on the street. So instead of mud and and all kinds of other nasty things, um, we'll have chalk painting. Artists will be doing chalk painting. So that's coming up on Wednesday this week. But then August 2nd for the August 2nd Art Walk, and for anybody who doesn't know what Art Walk is, is the second um, on the first Friday, every two months, the city of Montpelier has the art walk where all the local businesses and we have some local art galleries uh, open up and hang art on the wall. So I'm not quite sure how many venues are participating this time around, um, but it was a lot. And again, it's been a year. We're slowly rebuilding. People are slowly getting back involved in, in all these community events. And I'll be doing a, a community art project. So um, there'll be street performers. Uh, the restaurants will be open. And then I'll show you some more photos. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, so here you see a giant brush um, that is a handmade brush and some very large paper. These, uh, this paper is 52 inches by 52 inches. This brush is about five feet and the head of the brush, the bristles of the brush are made up of old tights that I shredded and bound with hemp rope on a dowel. And again, the teacher that I've practiced with cause he wanted, he did a, um, a large community endo project for an international organization. And they, he had a large brush designed by an architect that eight people could carry at the same time. <laughs> so I made this large brush. It, it, this is in itself is an art piece. Um, and, and then I painted these large paintings. While I was painting these paintings uh, a couple years ago, in the midst of painting these paintings, uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned. And so they've taken on a whole new meaning for me. Um, the practice has taken on a whole new meaning because the meditation and the approach, I was talking about how my current experience gets infused into the artwork. Mm -hmm. um, that's what's infused into these paintings. They're called Tonglen, which is a Buddhist practice of giving and receiving and where you take in the negative energy, take in negative energy, transmutate it within yourself and then send it back out into the world with a well wish. Um, and so 
the, we're go, I'm going to be doing this again um, with a group as a community art painting project on August 2nd. So you can kind of see the size of them there and then the brush in action. But on August 2nd, I'll bring out a big piece of paper and we'll do a peace meditation for the community. Uh, and then everybody will have an opportunity to add paint to the paper. And so anyone who wants to can add some color to the paper and then we'll swish it all around with a prayer or a, a good intention. And hopefully the painting will then be auctioned off or sold with the money donated to a local nonprofit organization. And then people will also have a table set up prior to the meditation and painting this piece. I'll spend about an hour with a, um, giving folks the opportunity to paint their own Enzo. That's great. That's very collaborative and interconnected and inspiring. Oh, good. <laughs> it's really in the spirit of Art Walk, which is so um, refreshing. Everybody, you know, the town percolates, you know, people are walking around and, you know, it's really a positive um, development here in Montpelier. And let me ask you, do you think Montpelier is having a cultural renaissance or have we, are we just discovering all the talents around? Um, you know, the, this this state and this town and this community has so many artists. There is so much creativity in this town. There are so many artists. And over the last year, it's been really interesting because prior to the flood, there was an aliveness and a, a, a cultural reemergence that was happening in 2023 before the flood. And then the flood really knocked people. They really, really knocked people. But what happens when empowered creative people get knocked down, they come back with even more power. And what I've been seeing this year is a renewed sense of energy to bring creativity into the communities and make it accessible for everybody. Um, the Vermont Arts Council is really an amazing organization. They've done all this research and study. They Their website is full of all these different databases. They have grants, pretty large, good-sized grants for people doing all kinds of different creative work in the state. Um, I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago with the Downtown and Preservation Conference uh, with other all women actually this time around, um, who had done different creative projects and used creativity in the wake of the flood in different communities. And uh, about a month ago, I was participating at a small arts festival in Worcester, Vermont, which is about 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes out of Montpelier. Um, so we're seeing all these little small art festivals popping out throughout the, the state. It's not only great for the communities, it's great for the artists to be able to step forward and put their art out to everybody. Um, and it really creates a vibrant creative conversation. <laughs> That's great. And Monica, thank you for your participation and contribution in all of these activities. We're getting to the end of the interview. So tell me, do you have any concluding commentary for our audience? Any last words you want to leave them with? Um, I, I would say to, to stay really, to do what you can to stay connected. And, and I, I think for some people who are feeling more isolated, who are more introverted, I kind of, I'm lucky because I can kind of do the extrovert. I'm kind of an extroverted introvert. And so uh -huh. I can pivot from one domain to the other. Um, but I think it's more important than ever if someone is feeling isolated or disconnected to to step forward and reach out and find like-minded people through community groups or meet up or, you know, just having coffee in town or hanging out at a local venue. And the you know, art walk is happening. If you're local, you can come to that. So there's just to encourage people to get out and, and get connected. Monica D. Giovanni, interdisciplinary artist. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome, Anne. And I'm, I'm great to see you again. <laughs> it was great fun. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist. <laughs>